Okay, thank you. So our uh, third uh, speaker, uh, and it's plural, is going to be a tag team uh, this time, uh, or for this one, and we are uh, lucky to have uh, Dr. Brandon Keene, who is an associate professor at Purdue University, uh, and Dr. Rebecca McNally Keene, who is an assistant professor of pediatrics at the IU School of Medicine, and they're going to be talking to us about enhancing equitable autism diagnosis, translating eye-tracking biomarkers to primary care. Welcome and thank you. Okay, thank you so much for having us. Uh, these are hard acts to follow, so. Uh, I hope we do the other speakers justice. Um, all right, so today we're going to take you along our journey, um, a marriage, if you will, of clinical and translational neuroscience, um, all with the goal of improving access, equity, and precision in early autism diagnosis. So first, we'll share our population health work to enhance access to early autism diagnosis through um, our work here across Indiana in the Early Autism Evaluation Hub System. Um, and then Brandon will detail our translational neuroscience efforts to enhance precision of primary care autism diagnosis. And then he'll talk with you um, about our next steps to bring this work um, to scale to impact populations um, in resource-constrained settings, uh, both locally and then uh, globally as well. So we'd like to uh, extend our gratitude to Indiana CTSI. All of this work started um, back in 2018 um, from a little funding from the project development team that uh, allowed us to, to pilot our work on uh, 10 young children in primary care. Um, and that allowed us to get an NAMHR 21 that funded the work we're going to talk about today. Um, and I've also been supported by um, a K-12 uh, early career award through the CTSI. So let's set the stage for you. Um, imagine you're the parent of a child who has just turned two. You've had concerns about his development and he just screened positive for autism at his two year well visit. Your pediatrician or family doctor says the next step is a diagnostic evaluation. But there's no one in your community who can do the evaluation, so you must come to Riley or another academic medical center. The wait list for an appointment is well over a year long. And once you get that appointment, you have to travel three hours to get here. You have to find care for your other children and you have to take off work. Your child finally gets that diagnosis and you realize you've missed months or years of critically important early intervention. This is the problem that hundreds of thousands of young children and their families are facing across the US and the problem that our work strives uh, to solve access and equity in early autism diagnosis. The Center for Disease Control estimates that one in 36 children are diagnosed with autism in the US. That's a lot of kids. Behavioral differences in children who later go on to receive an autism diagnosis emerge before the first birthday. In the second year of life, by about 14 months, the diagnosis is stable for the vast majority of children. But today, across the US, the average age of diagnosis is still over four years. And so kids are missing critical opportunities for interventions at the optimal time of impact that we know improve developmental outcomes, reduce family stress, and also save long-term system and care costs. And so the reasons for this uh, significant delay between parental concern and symptom onset and ultimate diagnosis are the product of many intersecting systemic factors. So we have a shortage of specialists who can do these evaluations. Specialists are clustered in uh, metropolitan areas. 
And we have very labor and cost intensive evaluation models that rely on gold standard assessment tools and methods. And so this results in the autism bottleneck where there are many more young children who need diagnostic evaluations than there are qualified clinicians to provide this service. So to address this um, public health problem, there's been a rapid um, acceleration in recent years in the development of community-based evaluation models that build capacity of primary care to deliver autism evaluations. And so these include um, uh, e-consult or teleconsult models um, from uh, specialist to primary care, embedding specialists within primary care to deliver evaluation services, and then training primary care providers or PCPs to conduct evaluations independently within their local practice. So to address our own challenges with the autism bottleneck here in Indiana, um, a brilliant team well ahead of their time, I can't take credit for that, I wasn't here then, uh, developed um, uh, the team led by Dr. Nancy Spogonski here in uh, Department of Pediatrics, developed and launched the Early Autism Evaluation Hub System. And our system has three guiding principles. First is that every Hoosier receives routine developmental uh, surveillance and screening as part of well child care. Second, for those children, um, young children ages 14 to 48 months, who are determined to be at increased likelihood based on that surveillance and screening, are referred for evaluation in their community primary care um, early autism evaluation hub. And for those children with complex clinical presentations, um, they're referred uh, for specialty evaluation at an autism diagnostic center. So very briefly, the work um, over the last decade of building the hub system has involved identification of pediatric champions. So uh, pediatricians, family physicians, nurse practitioners in targeted areas of need across our state and providing them with specialized training in autism diagnostic evaluation. Once clinicians and their teams uh, receive this specialized training, they begin providing autism evaluations in their community primary care practice, following a standardized best practice uh, clinical evaluation protocol. After they're trained, clinicians remain engaged in continuous um, building of skills and maintenance of their skills through a monthly learning collaborative. We think about our model as a learning health system where we provide updates on best uh, evidence and practices around autism diagnosis and care management, um, often providing uh, teams with continuing medical education. The hub teams then get access to specialists and we advocate for system change across our state um, and, and country that really benefits uh, their work as primary care providers and uh, the care that they can provide to their patients. We collect de-identified data on every evaluation conducted across our, our system, um, including data on adherence to clinical quality indicators. And then we continuously analyze this data to provide individual and group system level feedback to improve care and refine our processes. Since 2012, over 6,000, nearing 7,000 now, children have been evaluated in their local community primary care medical home with children seen um, across every Indiana ZTA code. Similar to CDC uh, prevalence estimates rising, our own rate of autism diagnosis has been increasing. Um, in 2023, 60% 60, uh, 60 of children evaluated in the hubs received an autism diagnosis at a mean age of 31 months, so substantially below the national average. Our demographic data is largely aligned with Indiana census expectations, and our system serves uh, a majority of children on public health insurance. So through our quality improvement work, we've demonstrated that we have a system of autism diagnosis that's feasible, uh, with improved access and reduced age of diagnosis, 
But what I really, what we really wanted to know um, to validate this approach is how accurate diagnosis um, in primary care is. How well did we train um, primary care clinicians? And is there a group of children for whom this approach works or doesn't work? And so we launched a study to answer this question. We received consecutive referrals of children from each uh, participating hub across the state. And we collected data from the primary care early autism evaluation hub um, uh, evaluation and diagnosis. And then our expert team, uh, largely through COVID, traveled around the states for several years to conduct blinded follow-up um, standard research grade uh, diagnostic evaluations of all of these children. We recruited um, 126 children uh, into this part of the study with, again, a mean age of about 30 months. Um, and what I'd like to just briefly highlight here is that much of our sample um, has a household income under $50,000 and a primary caregiver without a college education representing um, socioeconomic and educational diversity that's really lacking in many autism uh, health services studies. We found 82% diagnostic agreement between uh, the early autism evaluation hub primary care evaluation and our team's research grade evaluation. Diagnostic disagreements were largely false negatives or diagnostic misses with almost no overdiagnosis of autism. Sensitivity and specificity of the primary care diagnosis was 82%, positive predictive value was 93%, uh, percent, and negative predictive value was 62%. We found no demographic differences between true positives um, and false negative cases. Um, we found that uh, primary care clinicians reported both lower diagnostic certainty and a higher rate of referral for specialty evaluation for those autism missed cases. And this is exactly how our system was designed to function with referral of complex cases uh, to specialty care. Children in the false negative group also had higher um, verbal, nonverbal, and adaptive self-care skills but no differences in autism symptom severity. So we've shown through this work um, that the hub model is a feasible population health solution for increasing access to autism diagnosis for children in Indiana and beyond. So I would challenge us to think about this. If our model was adequately scaled across our state and beyond, most children could receive diagnosis in their local primary care medical home, dramatically reducing the really substantial delays and disparities that we see in autism diagnosis, and in turn, reducing the very significant uh, burden on specialty care. But further innovation and investment is needed to um, actualize this potential. And one important step in this is leveraging the power of translational neuroscience for a precision approach to autism detection and diagnosis. And that's what Brandon is going to talk to you about. So one of the goals of translational neuroscience in the area of autism research is to identify uh, biomarkers for autism detection. And there's been an enormous uh, and successful investment in the discovery of biomarkers as a potential tool for accurately identifying autism. Um, these biomarkers could address that bottleneck, at least in part, that Becca mentioned previously, and have the, the potential to transform the equity and accuracy of early autism diagnosis. But there is a, a significant translational gap between these sort of basic uh, discoveries into clinical benefit. And our goal was to determine whether or not uh, these eye tracking biomarkers can accurately identify kids in primary care and whether or not we can integrate these biomarkers within the hub model that Becca discussed to enhance the accuracy of autism diagnosis um, and inform a more sort of precision based approach to tailored interventions in autism. So, in general, we wanted to see whether or not we can give 
PCP is a tool, a new tool in their tool belt to help identify those missed cases, those cases in which you know, they're not diagnosing kids that um, do have autism. Um, just for those that aren't familiar, the FDA has defined what a biomarker is, which is just sort of a, a characteristic sort of a normal biological process, a pathogenic process, or some biological response to an intervention or a therapeutic intervention. Um, and they come in many flavors. You know, the one that we're most interested in here is the diagnostic biomarker. And there have been several, um, several studies that have shown a wide variety of techniques, including MRI and EEG, as potential biomarkers of differences in early brain development. But these are unlikely to prove feasible in sort of standard clinical care. And so to date, uh, eye tracking really is the most non-invasive, low-cost, feasible approach to identifying autism um, very early. And so there are several different markers that have been identified, um, some using sort of pupillary measures, some using looking time behavior, some using uh, basic ocular motor measures uh, that have been shown to be sensitive to autism very early in development. And so uh, embedded within the validation study that Becca talked about, where we do a blinded gold standard uh, diagnostic evaluation, kids also participated in sort of a 10 minute, uh, very brief eye tracking biomarker battery, which I'll discuss. Uh, in this case, um, kids are um, sort of seated in a high chair. They're watching a computer screen and that computer screen is just playing uh, videos for them to watch as we extract these eye tracking biomarker measures. They complete a quick uh, five point calibration so we can map where they're looking on the screen as they look at it. Um, after which they uh, sort of watch these videos for about 10 minutes uh, while we extract these different measures. Um, so some of the uh, things that they watch are very basic. So you're seeing a yellow dot. That's just where the child is looking as they're looking at the center of the screen. Here we're mapping actually just their resting pupil dilation, which maps onto a, a circuit in the brain called the locus ceruleus norepinephrine system. We also measure basic ocular motor uh, differences in terms of their fixation durations, their the amplitude or size of their eye movements, the velocity of those eye movements. Other measures that we extract that are uh, based on the pupil size have to do with a pupillary light reflex. So your kids are looking at something in the center, that screen flashes, and we can map essentially the, the latency or the time that it takes for the pupil to constrict and the amplitude or the magnitude of uh, the constriction, both of which have been shown to be sensitive to, to autism risk. Uh, another metric that we look at is how sticky attention is. So kids are looking at something at the center, something at the side appears, and we are just measuring the latency or the time it takes kids to move their eyes from the center to the side, or whether they move their eyes to the, to the side, whether they get sort of stuck on the item that's in the center. A separate looking time measure um, maps um, their attention to social and non-social information. So there's two videos that are played uh, side by side, and in this case, the only metric that we're really interested in is the time that they take or spend looking at the non-social images versus sort of the social images. Uh, the last, um, these are toddlers, you know, they get uh, bored relatively fast, right? Um, they're not the most compliant participants that we've worked with. Um, and so we show them cartoons, right? Uh, in between some of our more boring things. Um, and essentially what we're interested here is just how they're exploring these cartoons uh, as they're watching them. So again, how long they dwell when they're looking at things, the amplitude of the sides of their uh, saccades or eye movements, just as they're watching these cartoons. So from this, uh, these sort of measures, we extract a bunch of different eye movement and pupillary measures, six of which uh, in our sample significantly predicted um, autism outcome. Um, and so there's a lot on this slide, but essentially the, the teal bars are our autism sample, the purple bars and dots are those that um, uh, were a non-autism uh, sort of comparison group um, diagnosed with developmental delays or language delays. Um, so, um, let's see what we got here. Uh, so um, as expected, the, uh, the autism group looks significantly more at the non-social than the social images. You can see there's a great deal of variability, right? Um, but as a group, um, looking more at the non-social compared to the social predicted autism outcome um, for the sort of uh, disengagement paradigm. 
Again, those kids that were stuck more at the, on the sort of center target before making an eye movement to the side, much more likely to have an autism outcome based on that sort of gold standard uh, research battery. Uh, both the latency and the amplitude of their pupillary uh, light reflex, again, significantly predicted autism outcome, as did uh, basic ocular motor measures on both sort of the resting, very boring task, and the cartoon. So the, the longer the fixations that kids made, the more likely they were to have sort of autism outcomes. And so what we did was we combined all six of these measures that significantly predicted autism outcome into a single metric, which is just our biomarker score, which was just a, a yes or a no, right? Were any of these kids above a given threshold? So we essentially created a 95% specificity uh, threshold um, to sort of reduce the number of false positives that might be present um, across each of these six. And if, if a child was above threshold on any one of these measures, uh, they were given sort of a bio plus score indicative of an autism diagnosis. Um, and those that had no biomarkers for which they exceeded threshold were given sort of a bio minus score. So we have a, sort of a dichotomous variable and we can look at it just like uh, Becca mentioned with the PCP diagnosis here. So we can compare our biomarker score to the sort of expert research grade evaluation, our reference standard diagnosis of autism. And again, similar to the PCP findings, there's about 80% agreement between our biomarker measure and the gold standard uh, sort of autism diagnosis. I think the most important thing uh, from these particular findings is that in addition to uh, using the biomarker to predict autism, within our statistical models, we also combined uh, the PCP diagnosis and the PCP's diagnostic certainty. Right? If the biomarkers you know, aren't predicting autism outcome above and beyond what we expect based on the PCP, then their utility is relatively limited, right? Uh, but what we found is when we included those two things within our statistical models, the biomarkers still significantly predicted autism outcome above and beyond uh, the PCP diagnosis and their certainty. And so the, the question then becomes, how can we integrate these eye tracking biomarkers into sort of standard clinical care? And so to do this, we used a sort of a machine learning approach uh, called classification and regressive tree analysis, which is essentially um, sort of creating a, its own decision tree based on the variables that we input into the model, which sort of sequentially determines which variable accounts for the most or greatest amount of variance within our outcome, which again is reference standard autism diagnosis. So within our model, we included four variables, the hub PCP diagnosis, which uh, Becca talked about earlier, their diagnostic certainty in that diagnosis, whether they were low or high in their certainty, and then two biomarker variables. One is that bio plus score, you know, whether or not they were above threshold on any one of our six biomarker measures, and then a biomarker frequency, which is just the sum of those biomarkers that kids were above threshold for. So zero if they had a bio negative score, or one, two, three, four, five, or six, if they were above threshold on any of those six particular measures. And so uh, we put these four variables into our model. And based on this, the first sort of a decision point or node was uh, the composite biomarker. So whether or not a child was above threshold on any one of our particular uh, markers, again, 90% of kids that, or about 90% of kids that had a bio plus score, uh, had a reference standard diagnosis of autism. The second sort of uh, decision point was the PCP diagnosis, right? Um, so 100% um, of kids um, that uh, had a PCP diagnosis of autism and a BioPlus score had a reference standard diagnosis of autism. So if you have an autism diagnosis and a, a positive biomarker, as a um, uh, in this, in our sample, 100% probability that that child had a reference standard diagnosis of autism. The more important part, and I'm going to focus really on this side of the tree, are those non-autism cases, cases in which the PCP did not diagnose autism in that particular child. The third decision point had to do with the biomarker frequency. So in this case, these are all kids that have a, bio, a positive biomarker, but do they have more than one positive biomarker? And in this case, those kids that had more than one positive biomarker, but were 
essentially not diagnosed with autism by the PCP, 100% of those kids had a reference standard diagnosis of autism. So in other words, those missed cases that were talked about before, those cases in which the PCP is not making an autism diagnosis, but the child um, should receive an autism diagnosis, this sort of um, having more than one biomarker in this case is 100% likely that those kids um, should have received an autism diagnosis. The last decision point has to do with the clinician's certainty about their diagnosis. Again, those uh, low certainty cases, right, with a positive biomarker, 90% of those cases uh, have a reference standard diagnosis of autism. So again, that's highlighting the, the missed cases that could be identified with the use of the biomarker. And so we can create essentially a, a, a diagnostic decision, right, based on these trees to help you know, more accurately identify um, kids with autism. And if we look at the accuracy of our integrated model, uh, we have 90% agreement with the reference standard, which exceeds both the PCP alone and the biomarker alone um, analyses. And so just to quickly summarize, you know, we've feasibly shown that we can feasibly acquire these data in the primary care, which is sort of no uh, primary care setting, which is no uh, uh, simple feat. Um, that these eye tracking biomarkers can successfully identify autism outcomes um, in a sort of a high risk sample that's been referred for an autism evaluation, and that these biomarkers provide additional diagnostic utility above and beyond the PCP's diagnosis and their certainty about that diagnosis. And lastly, that our integrated model, which uh, marries both the, uh, the biomarker and the PCP um, diagnosis can facilitate more accurate diagnoses. So our future work uh, is attempting to scale this to broader contexts and sort of taking a sort of precision-based approach to, um, to the population, right? Our uh, first study, which will, our first uh, proposal, which is uh, gonna be reviewed, I guess, in October, is an R01 that's essentially uh, trying to uh, do an internal and external validation of our integrated diagnostic model. So a common, a major uh, translational roadblock is model validation. So we've got this model, but how are we ever gonna bring it to sort of standard clinical care? And so we're proposing to uh, do a, a 800 uh, uh, sample um, internal and external validation of this particular integrated model. Additionally, we're um, uh, trying to test the validity of our biomarkers um, outside of the US. So all, almost all biomarker work in the, in the, uh, done in the area of autism has focused on Western industrialized uh, countries. And so we wanna see whether or not this biomarker approach can be taken to low and middle income countries. And so um, uh, just this week, we learned that uh, this particular proposal has been funded. And so we will be taking the biomarker approach um, to Kenya, where we will try to scale our system um, and determine whether or not the, the biomarkers that can be used to identify autism here can be used to uh, be identified autism um, everywhere. Um, again, in order to sort of scale our model to these sort of global or, or low resource settings, we're, we're collaborating with colleagues, uh, engineering colleagues at Purdue to develop a, a low cost a more scalable eye tracker. So we use a research grade eye tracking system to date, um, but we're attempting to create a more um, computer vision or AI driven based eye tracking approach that um, is much cheaper, much more scalable, um, and will allow us to, to acquire biomarkers um, much more readily. And then the, the, the other um, sort of adaptation we're doing is we're trying to create a much more engaging uh, paradigms to to measure our biomarkers. So these are essentially experimental paradigms, but we are trying to cartoonify them um, to make them, again, more engaging for the toddler, toddler population that we're, we're trying to test. And so we're essentially making these cartoon versions of our experimental paradigms that still allow us to acquire the biomarker measures, the eye tracking measures that we, that we need. And then lastly, to sort of bring it back to, to precision, uh, the goal, um, uh, one of the goals of this work is to identify essentially biomarker fingerprints, um, so patterns of biomarkers that might allow us to sort of individualize um, uh, intervention approaches uh, to provide more sort of precise, 
precise and cost-effective methods for intervention allocation um, in young kids. So uh, um, just to thank uh, those kids and families that participated, the hubs around um, the state of Indiana that allow us to uh, uh, come into their offices and acquire these data, and the teams at both uh, IU School of Medicine and at Purdue. So thank you. Okay, got time for a couple of quick questions. That's fascinating. Thank you. When, you know, it's uh, the biomarker stuff is uh, really timely with the, I don't know if you've seen recently in Indiana, they passed the biomarker bill. Uh, I think it's like 273 or something like that. That's requiring healthcare insurance companies to cover biomarker testing. As long as there's a couple criteria, you've got to have guidelines, it's got to be evidence-based and a variety of these things. But uh, they took effect July 1st, so it'll be interesting to see how long it takes something like this to get there. Yeah, Kurt. That partly addresses, uh, so I had a, a related two-part question. So excellent uh, clinical and translational research for a very important public health problem. Um, I'm not a pediatric primary care physician, I'm an adult primary care physician, so a lot of times when the message is take it to primary care, there's two barriers. One is you need some appetite among primary care physicians to do this work. And maybe you've discovered like who has the appetite, who doesn't, and it's probably not every primary care physician. But second, way downstream would be, you know, could they get reimbursed in the office? Probably not at the level of especially referral at, at Riley, but they're gonna have to get extra reimbursement, probably partly for the uh, biomarker testing and probably partly just for the time it takes for clinical evaluation. Any comments on either of those? Yes, uh, both very relevant um, problems. Uh, so we don't think about, um, to your point, the hub model, um, at least the, the clinical piece of what we're doing right now as something that every primary care um, clinician should or could do. The, the current investment in terms of time, training, and all of the related uh, things that come with that is not insignificant. And so we really over the past 10 years have um, uh, found that this works well with a, a champion, someone who really cares about autism or neurodevelopment, um, has connections in their community and advocates within their system to do this work. And so, yes, I think it takes a champion to do this. And, and we don't, I don't think about this in, at least in its current form as something that every single person will do. Um, we have found methods for reimbursement um, that that um, are not adequate, um, but are scraping by at the moment. But we certainly need sort of payment reform on a larger scale to support this primary, secondary uh, specialist collaboration for these efforts. Um, I think the idea with the biomarkers, though, is that perhaps we could reduce burden in terms of um, training, time, et cetera, um, if we were able to sort of validate this on a large scale, that, that perhaps would reduce the need for um, champions to do this diagnostic work. But I think that remains to be seen. Great work. It seems like the marriage has been quite successful. <laughs> so far, um, so good. We're locked in for another five years now. <laughs> my question is about um, I, building on Kurt's question, I think, too, is I think one of the really exciting things for me, and Beck, I think you and I have talked about this a little bit, but I'd be curious your thoughts to share with the group is um, the potential to expand this into the non-clinical realm for screening. I'm thinking daycares or other community sites. Um, how much is that a possibility for the bio, you know, for the biomarker component? Um, because perhaps it's those kids that we don't see in the clinic who are uh, the most at risk. Um, could you comment? Um, I mean, I think as a screening measure, uh, I think it has a great utility. I think, you know, I think the, the way that we think about it is that you know the integration is really going to be necessary as a diagnostic measure um, and that they'll need to be a clinician expert or not that sort of lays eyes on the child talks to the family and that there is 
great utility in sort of you know integrating those two bits of information to formulate a most accurate diagnosis but definitely think that um you know things like the eye tracking biomarkers could be integrated in you know even well child checkup visits but also things like you know perhaps you know if it's cartoonified enough maybe you know um you know into you know daycare or other other contexts yeah i think um there are others uh in our field who are doing more targeted work on population screening using biomarkers um and integrating that um uh at the sort of early uh, uh, population detection um stage so lots of possibilities but but i think yeah i mean your point is well taken that uh we're getting the kids who get to primary care to get to re get referred and get to an evaluation and there's a lot we know in our own data there's a lot of inequities in terms of who gets to us and we need to think about how we can collectively really address that problem. So that was just a great combination that CTSIs are for. Um, we deal in the cancer community with exactly the same problem that just brought up of how do you deal effectively with the primary care network. Um, the problem is the handoff and uh, no primary care doctor wants to investigate the worst cause of everything they see, which is cancer. And no parent wants to go through the diagnosis of developmental delays and they can read on social media that autism can be, which is why we have 48 months, can be not the diagnosis for late development. There are many other problems. So the biggest barrier we have to having somebody from primary care work with us to a, a named well-known cancer center is they don't want to make that decision for the patient. They want to go to the authority, but you can't be a cancer center because then they know why their doctor did this and they don't think they're honest and they don't form a partnership with primary care. The problem for you guys is you built an unbelievable and it's great you have five years. You've got to figure out how to get parents to want to participate because they understand that you're not necessarily going to diagnose autism. You're going to go back and there's a there's an interesting rate that when your concordance of tests you just showed us as professionals, but not, there's no message for primary care and the doctors. And you don't want to be called an autism center because that means the primary care doc thinks your kid has autism and parents won't buy in just like pa patients won't go for cancer tests at a cancer center because they think you've already decided. Have you thought about that problem? Because now you've got five years to really take this great platform you have and make it viable to the community of care. And uh, all I would say is draw up, which is what a CTSI does, are disciplines of others facing that problem. And I can tell you the cancer community has faced that since the 1990s when we started to have the earlier diagnosis, the better outcomes kind of stuff. And you guys are right there on this expansion on autism. So how are you thinking about that handoff? Because it's such an important question, not just for the financial aspects, but for the buy-in of the patients in this case that are, are parents that are the deciders. Yeah, so I, I think we have a real diversity in terms of, um, parent buy-in um, and beyond parents um, to all of the interconnected sort of service systems that support young children and their families. Um, right now, uh, we, I think we face a problem where, um, a good problem where families and parents are very educated and knowledgeable about autism and um, child development, and they are coming and seeking autism diagnoses um, at greater and greater uh, numbers, which is why we have this bottleneck problem. Um, and so, but at the same time, we still have uh, uh, pieces of the population who face uh, very substantial differences in terms of um, uh, access to knowledge and um, uh, screening and um, uh, stigma and all of those sorts of things. Um, and so I think we, uh, as you say, we need to work with our community partners, um, not just primary care, but, um, but all of the partners who uh, serve young children and their families to take a tailored approach to, to address uh, the, the real diversity in terms of 
um, uh, interest and commitment to um, early diagnosis. I don't know if that answers your question, but. Um. It's really helpful because I think, I think there's lots we can learn from you and you can learn from us because these are the real handoffs to get equitable distribution of these diagnoses that are nobody wants for anybody, but the earlier we make it, the better the outcome. Yes. Okay, thank you. That was, uh, <laughs> Speaking of handoffs, I'll hand it off to Sarah to uh, hand us off to lunch.